Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, more controversy over San Diego's port and the newspaper's campaign to redevelop part of the waterfront. Did a publisher threaten to move against the port commission? We'll have the latest from our investigations desk. Plus, American Public Media's program, Marketplace Money, discovers what's behind San Diego's pockets of poverty. Host Tess Viglin joins us with a preview of special reports on living in America's finest city without money. And your smartphone could help save your life in a disaster thanks to a new app. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Irwin Jacobs and by In the last two days, our investigations desk has been telling you about the political connections between UT San Diego's new owners and local politicians and the influence the UT owners are trying to exert to promote their vision of building a sports complex at the 10th Avenue Marine Terminal. The story took another turn today. A port commissioner told our investigations desk UT San Diego Chief John Lynch threatened to disband the port. KPBS investigative reporter Meetha Sharma talked with the two men today. Dwayne, today Port Commissioner Scott Peters released the entire email between himself and UT San Diego's Chief Executive Officer John Lynch in August. In that email, Lynch asked Peters how he intended to vote on an impending 24.5 year lease with Dole Food Company. Lynch went on to say in the email, quote, this will become a major issue in the campaign and the UT will be forced to lead a campaign to disband the port. Commissioner Peters says he interpreted that line in Lynch's email as an attempt by the newspaper chief to influence his vote on the Dole contract. I think it's confusing to have uh, someone in journalism making that kind of threat against the port, <laughs> port commissioner uh, who's trying to take a vote on something. But Lynch says that was not his intention. It, it wasn't a threat. Uh, what it was was a call to action for every politician, everyone serving this community to realize that this was a giveaway of public property. Dwayne, now Lynch is saying he never wrote that line in the email. I contacted Peters about Lynch's denial this evening. He called Lynch's claim, quote, a doozy. Peters offered to have his computer examined to verify Lynch's threatening email. Dwayne. KPBS investigative reporter, Amitha Sharma. Now we take a closer look at what developers and the Port Commission are fighting over, a valuable piece of real estate along San Diego Bay. Investigations desk producer Joanne Farian has the story. Yesterday, we told you the new owner of San Diego County's two major newspapers, along with his business partner, are continuing to pitch their plan to do away with the Port of San Diego's 10th Avenue Marine Terminal. They propose building a new stadium and sports arena in its place. They say the terminal simply doesn't make enough money. iNews source reporter Brad Racino has spent the last few months examining that claim. He files this report. Uh, this is where they make some bets. There's also a bunch of cargo that also comes into the port of San Diego. That's the captain of the Spirit of San Diego. I took this super touristy harbor cruise to get a better view of the downtown skyline, to see the hotels, the Navy warships, and one landmark that's causing a lot of commotion. And here we got the port of San Diego, 10th Avenue Marine Terminal. And there it is, 96 acres of cement sticking out into the bay between the Coronado Bridge and the Convention Center. On the ground, windmill towers line the open area between rows of warehouses. Longshoremen offload a ship docked along the northern berth, and trucks transport containers from the water's edge to supermarkets and retailers around the city. These are the good days, when things are busy. But right now, the port district is defending itself from developers and critics who believe the good days are too few and far between, and the land at 10th Avenue would be better suited for hotels, a stadium, or a park. So how do you measure the value of a port, or better yet, one terminal? We began by looking at the rental agreements between the port and the companies operating on that terminal. 
There are five long-term tenants, the biggest and most well-known being Dole Food Company, which made headlines last month for signing a lease with the port that secured its 20 acres for the next 24 and a half years. John Lynch, CEO of UT San Diego, referred to this deal as Chiquita Banana Caper and called it one of the great scandals of our time during a presentation to the Harvard Business School Club in San Diego a few weeks back. The annual rent between the five companies ranges from about $1 per square foot to around $7 per square foot. And in combination with other charges, they generated around $5 million for the port this fiscal year. During the last fiscal year, all the tenants at 10th Avenue generated around $7.5 million. But what do numbers like that mean? I spoke with several experts around the country and all agree, you can't determine the value of a port by how much it makes per square foot or per terminal. Those numbers, they say, will always fail to impress. So we need to earn revenue, but if, all, if that's all we meant to do, or all we were meant to do, or mandated to do, then we wouldn't have any waterfront parks. In fact, we'd have probably figured out some way to build condominiums or, you know, timeshares or hotels all the way around the waterfront. Companies that are tenants here on the port, uh, the longshoremen, the railroad people, pilots, tugs, everybody, and they're all good paying jobs. Jerry Shipman lists some of the jobs this terminal supports. Of course, he has an interest in keeping this a working dock. He's the new president of the San Diego branch of the International Longshore and Warehouse Union. But experts agree with Shipman. You have to look at all the jobs and companies associated with port activity, like truckers, customs brokers, federal agencies, and engineers. The port's most recent economic assessment was released in 2008. It says nearly 20,000 jobs in the region and the state were in some way related to activity at the terminals. But that was before the recession. Today, terminal opponents argue there aren't enough workers creating enough revenue to merit the sprawling waterfront real estate in America's finest city. Port supporters say once the terminal's gone, it's gone for good. And with it, you lose a rare deep and warm water port that provides well-paying, blue-collar jobs in an industry as old as the country itself. Before I bombard you with all my naval knowledge, I know about these naval ships. On the spirit of San Diego, you pass sparkling hotels, the sales of the convention center, green space, and then hunks of metal and pipes crisscrossing the open air of the terminal for the next half mile. A great view or an eyesore? It all depends on where you're standing. For the Investigations Desk of iNews Source and KPBS, I'm Brad Racino. And joining me now is Brad Racino. Now, Brad, your report really uh, focused on one part of activity at the port, and that was the leases. But there's a lot more going on. Tell me more about that. Well, once a shipment comes into the port, that's not where it stops. There are other agencies that uh, have dealings with, with the port in terms of getting it out. So you have to look at the truckers and the customs brokers, as I said in the, in the package, and the railway agencies, the pilots, the tugboats, everybody has, has uh, a stake in the game. Now, you know you've been working on this for a very long time, and you took a lot of this information, all of this research, and you packaged it in a very different way online. Tell me about that. Well, um, in researching this story, I spoke with many experts who said that in order to understand this issue, you can't just look at the leases, you have to look at the whole thing. So that's what we tried to do, was present the whole thing to the public to look at not only the leases and the revenue, but all the companies associated with the port, what the mayor, uh, mayoral candidates have to say about this issue, what experts in the region have to say about this issue. So it's a one-stop shop for everything you need to know about the 10th Avenue Terminal. And that's at kpbs.org slash port interactive feature. I urge people to go there. Thank you, Brad Racino. Well, yesterday, Congressman and mayoral candidate Bob Filner responded to part one of our report by demanding the release of records of any communications between his rival, Carl DeMaio, and the owners of UT San Diego. Last week, before our story, Congressman Filner came to the KPBS studios to talk with me about the stadium proposal. Here is that pre-recorded interview. <laughs> Mayoral candidate Congressman Bob Filner has made the 10th Avenue Terminal an important part of his economic plan if elected mayor. He joins me now. Congressman, thanks for being Hi, here. Thank you. First, let's get a couple of things on the record. As you know, the owner of the newspaper, Doug Manchester, the CEO of the paper, John Lynch, have both proposed building a new Charger Stadium, a big sports complex, at the site of the 10th Avenue Terminal. Do you support their plan? No, I don't. Uh, 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 in fact, you know, they support the other candidate, and uh, so I assume he's the one that's going to support this. But 
Uh, I think that would damage uh, irretrievably the biggest opportunity we have for expansion of middle class jobs in San Diego, and that's the 10th Avenue Terminal. So I say that's a non-starter. I want to go back to that plan that you have, but one, one last thing on the record. We also obtained an email from John Lynch sent to a port commissioner August 10th. In that email, he says he has the support of one of the mayoral candidates, and I just want to read to you what he says. He says, we actually have made significant progress with labor, chargers, county, business, navy, and one of the mayoral candidates. Is that you? I don't think it's me, so uh, they've never talked to me. They. Uh, as, uh, as, as I like to say, by the way, you know, Carl de Mayo says reform in every other word that he uses. Reform means real estate for Manchester. That is, I think that's what uh, Papa Doug at the uh, Union Tribune really wants. He wants the, the mayor to approve his, uh, his property uh, adjustments and zonings at, at Mission Valley, downtown, and, uh, and the port terminal. Well, I'll tell you, Carl de Mayo was here the other day, and he said it's not him either. Well, then, then uh, they, better, uh, they better decide uh, that they endorse the wrong candidate, because <laughs> it's certainly no for me. Uh, and they have said, by the way, and I think this is very inappropriate, they have, the editor was quoted on tape as saying they're going to do everything pos they can to stop the election of Bob Filner for mayor. I don't think that's the way a, uh, our, our daily paper ought to be proceeding. I want to talk more about your plan with regard to the 10th Avenue Terminal. How do you plan to increase economic activity? You know, the, uh, the, as a port, as I've said on several occasions, is, is our best, uh, I think, avenue in the future for the expansion of middle class jobs. And the port has a plan for the expansion of both uh, 10th Avenue and for our, the terminal at National City, which is the two places where we do most of the cargo. They want to modernize all the facilities. They want to, uh, to, to make sure we have the infrastructure for what we call uh, bulk, bulk goods. Uh, there's container ports like Los Angeles. Uh, we're never going to compete with Los Angeles, so we're going to have a niche market. And they want to uh, make sure that the infrastructure is there, that there are routes in and out of the port, uh, taking into account the sensitivity and uh, the quality of life in our neighborhoods around there. They want to uh, make sure that there are marine highways built, for example. And this is a really important thing. Imagine if we could put on barges bulk material from here to L.A. or San Francisco or Seattle. We could take thousands of trucks off the road. Uh, and I'm going to be working with the mayors of those other cities and uh, to make sure that we have those, uh, those uh, marine highways. But we can, so, and, and we have to go international. I mean, the mayor ought to be leading the way toward welcoming uh, other cities and other countries toward uh, expanding their trade with San Diego. Now, there's long been a debate in terms of the value of the 10th Avenue Terminal. And we've been doing a lot of stories about it uh, as well. Uh, I know that the leases, the tenants bring in, I think it's about $7.5 million per year uh, to this terminal. Do you renegotiate those leases? Do you get new tenants? What do you do specifically to say that this this terminal is really sort of paying its way? Well, for you know, the, the, we we need to modernize it. Many of the structures have to be modernized. Uh, but we just, by the way, negotiated a new lease. Uh, I should say the port just negotiated a new lease with Dole uh, Fruit Company for fruit coming in on uh, in Tenth Avenue. And in that lease, so that renegotiation, they agreed to build modernized facilities, for example. So we're, we're going to it's it's going to take a process, uh, but you can. Uh, bring in new infrastructure. You can bring in new uh, new ways of, of intermodal transport. You may have to look. I mean, in the, the port of the future is going to have what we call inland uh, inland ports. That is, you do much of the uh, intermodal transport more inland, uh, and find the ways to transport between the port and the uh, and that inland uh, facility. Uh, there are many ways. Uh, the, port, uh, the port administration now, I think, is on a good path toward increasing, our, uh, increasing uh, the cargo, increasing the capacity, and to making us, you know, we're the biggest city on the, on the, on the east or west coast that does not seen as a maritime center, right. and I think we can do that. You mentioned the dual lease, and I know we um, have some tape of John Lynch talking about that lease. I think he refers to it as the Chiquita Chiquita banana caper. <laughs> and, and he goes on to say, look, that you've got a port, you've got a marine terminal generating, you know, whether it's seven or eight, five million dollars. Um, if you put two hotels at that site, it could generate millions, tens of millions of dollars for the city. Doesn't he have a point? Or do people well, on that side a, of the argument have a point? He has a point if, you, if you're just thinking hotels and low, uh, low wage jobs. Right now, the port generates uh, directly and indirectly about 46,000 jobs. That's a lot of jobs. And in fact, a, uh, a typical longshoreman 
tough work, but he makes or she makes one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars a year. Not the low-wage jobs that the uh, the, the hotels and uh, Mr. Manchester have uh, built their uh, their money on. Uh, but we're talking about potentially thousands and thousands of new jobs, good-paying, middle-class jobs, jobs that we lost when the defense industry was lost here. So he's looking at the old San Diego, where we build a few people, build a few hotels, pay a lot of people minimum wage, and they get all of the, uh, the benefits of the port. Meanwhile, thousands of working people are denied that kind of uh, job. I'm so uh, have to it's time for a new, a new way to look at it. One last thing. Has John Lynch, Doug Manchester, ever contacted you no, to they talk haven't. about their plan? Never they have asked not. you about it? Okay. I did read their editorial, okay. but uh, they have never they talked never to me. They never consulted you. Okay, yeah. Congressman Bob Filner, thanks for being here. Thank you. Our full investigations report can be found on the web at kpbs.org slash port. Republican Carl DeMaio has picked up an endorsement across party lines from Qualcomm founder Erwin Jacobs, a Democrat. Jacobs says he met, he's met with both candidates a few times and listened to some debates and believes DeMaio has a better understanding of the city's problems and ways to deal with them. DeMaio says he's honored to have Jacobs' support. I hope that it does two things. Number one, uh, I hope that it brings more people into the campaign. Uh, and I hope that it continues to, as mayor, allow me to reach across uh, party labels, reach across different points of view to bring people together. Jacobs says he won't actively campaign for DeMaio because his time is limited. In fact, he couldn't attend today's announcement. By the way, Jacobs is a major supporter of KPBS. Mayoral candidate Bob Filner also announced several endorsements today from women supporters, including State Senator Christine Kehoe, former State Senator Dee Dee Alpert, and Assemblywoman Tony Atkins. A lakeside man pleaded not guilty today in the shooting of two sheriff's deputies. Dan Witzak was arraigned in the hospital on three counts of attempted murder. He and the deputies were wounded in a shootout Tuesday. The deputies were checking out a report Witzak had molested his girlfriend's daughters. The deputies are still hospitalized, one in critical condition tonight. Firefighters have completely surrounded a 2,500-acre fire near the Campo Indian Reservation. They've also identified a man who died in the East County fire. 69-year-old Carson Robeson chose not to leave his home. It burned, along with 10 other homes and 14 outbuildings. A new smart app. A new smartphone app will send emergency information to San Diegans during fires and other disasters. The SD emergency app will include maps, lists of shelters, and social media announcements from first responders. It's available for iPhones, iPads, and Android devices. Nearly a million property bills, tax bills, are headed to San Diego mailboxes. The county tax collector says it's a record number and should generate more than $4.5 billion in revenue. San Diego is called America's finest city, but like so many other cities, about 15% of our population live in severe poverty. Peggy Pico explains the psychology of being poor and its impact on making financial decisions. Compared to the rest of the country, San Diego's cost of living is about 43 percent higher than the U.S. average. But there's a lot more to being poor than lack of money. Tess Viglin, host of Marketplace Money, which airs on KPBS radio Saturday afternoons, has a series of reports on the tough choices the poor face in San Diego. Tess, thanks for joining us. It's my pleasure, Peggy. Why did, why did you choose San Diego for a place to do this economy series? Well... Because I think when people uh, think of San Diego, they don't necessarily think of poverty, um, at least on, on the national level. Uh, you think of places like the Hotel Dell and Coronado and La Jolla and you know some of the other wealthy places in the city. But as a matter of fact, uh, San Diego County actually is 15% of its population lives in poverty and that directly mirrors the national average. And so we thought, you know, what better place to go and try to maybe dispel some of the myths about rich versus poor uh, than San Diego. What neighborhoods did you visit? We uh, mostly are, uh, uh, spent our time in City Heights um, and visited with three different families, uh, all living at or uh, under the national poverty level. 
and just tried to get a sense from them of what it's like to try to live on such a small amount of money um, with large families, uh, you know, it's particularly in an economy that is not really uh, being kind to anyone at this point. What were some of their personal financial decisions that they were talking about, these trade-off decisions that they have to make on a daily basis? Well, it really comes down to choosing uh, between basics. You know, are you going to pay for food for the day or are you going to gas up your car? That's assuming that you even have a car, which uh, one of these families, family of six, did not have a car. Uh, you're making decisions about, you know, ha how to go to the grocery store with $20 and feed a family of six all day. So that's breakfast, that's lunch, that's dinner. That's got to put some stress on these making these psychologically. I know there's research. Yes. What did you discover there as far as living in poverty and making these types of decisions constantly? It takes a huge toll. Um, you know, a lot of our self-worth, our self-image is wrapped up in what we're able to provide, not just for ourselves, but for our family and, and for our neighbors. And when you're struggling on a daily basis, to put food on the table, you know, it, it just has a real effect on how you think about yourself and how you think about life and how you think about opportunity. Um, you know, even in this country, this wealthy country, uh, where we grow up with this notion that anything is possible, uh, when you're living in poverty for years on end, it's, it's hard to see that that's available to you. What about this? I often hear people complain. Well, we heard in Tom Fudge's report, yes. you know, you can't be poor, you have a cell phone, or you can't right. be poor, you live in America and have a refrigerator. Are the poor judged more harshly than everyone else? Absolutely. You know, we, we all make decisions at the grocery store, right? Um, whether, you know, no matter where you are on the income scale. But when the poor make decisions, uh, like, you know, if, if you have a cell phone and yet you're complaining about only having $20 a day for groceries, well, why do you have a cell phone? But we live in a modern society, and I don't know that we can expect those in poverty to simply just exist in a different level uh, of modern society. And it's it's hard to do anything without a cell phone in in this day and age. Yeah, it's not comparing apples and oranges, certainly. It really isn't. Let me ask you, what did you see here in San Diego specifically that offered some hope? Are people able to move up? Did you see anything yes. here? Yes, absolutely. Uh, one of the families that we profile is a single mother uh, who exited an abusive relationship some years ago and has been was able to save what, what may sound like not a lot of money, but $80 a month uh, for seven years and was finally able to recently purchase her own home. Uh, we also profiled uh, a young man, a gentleman, 18 years old. Family came from Mexico and he's the first to go to college. He's got a full ride from the, from the uh, Gates Foundation to UCSB. Uh, so, the, you know, there are good stories coming out of it. And, you know, again, I think that anyone in that situation is always looking to try to get out. And it um, seems and to be some opportunities. We'll exactly. look forward to hearing them on your series. Tess Viglin, host of Marketplace Money, thanks so much for joining Thank us. Thank you, Peggy. Marketplace Money airs on KPBS Radio Saturday afternoons at 3. The Tough Choices series begins October 6th. San Diego's Water Authority has made a deal to buy every drop of water produced by a planned desalination plant. The project on the Carlsbad coast would be the largest in the Western Hemisphere, producing 50 million gallons of water a day. It's expected to be ready for service in 2016. San Diego City College is now home to the first chapter of the National Veterans for Peace. It's designed to help and heal student veterans making the transition back home. Not just to civilian life, but to student life. Um, there's a lot more structure and organization that veterans are used to. Uh, it's, it's a difficult transition to civilian life because you don't really have that community that you depend on. 
Forty-three percent of City College's vets are women. The center provides a meeting place on campus to focus on academic, community, and wellness programs. It will also help to strengthen ties with other veteran organizations on college campuses around San Diego. The La Jolla Playhouse is enlisting in a program for veterans and military families. The Blue Star Theater Program offers free and discounted tickets. It will also offer workshops and classes and postings for theater jobs. Reptile mania has taken hold at the San Diego Zoo. Zookeepers are showing off creatures of the cold-blooded kind. They say kids tend to be curious about lizards and snakes, but it's their parents who tend to shy away. You know, some people have their own um, lack of knowledge, maybe, or not, not certain about what to expect with a reptile. And that's one of the great things about this event. We get to get that education out there. Once that education's out there, they get to know more about the species. That's when the compassion comes out. And that's when we start talking about conservation, which is very important to us. Reptile mania continues through Sunday. Recapping tonight's top story, the CEO of UT San Diego is denying a report. He sent a threatening email to a San Diego port commissioner. Commissioner Scott Peters told our investigations desk he got this email from John Lynch regarding a long-term lease for the 10th Avenue Marine Terminal. Lynch and his partner, Doug Manchester, are pushing for a sports complex on the site. Peters says he interpreted the email as an attempt to influence his vote on the contract with Dole Food Company. In an interview today, Lynch told KPBS it wasn't a threat but a call to action. But later in the day, he called us to say he didn't send the email at all. We have the full story online at kpbs.org slash port. And you can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. You have a great night.